Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Gender Equality Academy webinar series. My name is Vasya Matesi, and I'm the deputy coordinator of the project, as well as a project manager in VLabs, uh, the organization that coordinates this very project, which is situated in Greece and uh, Cyprus. Today's webinar is about applying intersectional perspectives in research and innovation, the cases of urban cycling and artificial intelligence. And uh, I would like to let you know a few words about the project, what it is about, before we start with the webinar. So, what is Gender Equality Academy? What we are doing? Uh, we have witnessed that there are many gender equality programs, many projects in the great gain knowledge on gender equality in research and innovation. But still, we see there is a small proportion of researchers and practitioners that are familiar with the theoretical background and the concepts of gender and feminist scholarship. At the same time, gender analysis remains rarely appropriated within business projects and there are large differences among research organizations in various countries. What the project does is that it brings a holistic approach. As an Horizon 2020 project, which is funded by the European Union's uh, Research and Innovation Programme, we are developing and at the same time implementing a high quality capacity building programme on gender equality in research, innovation and higher education. In the realms of this project, we are offering different formats and different topics of training on gender equality in research and innovation. We have in-person training sessions, interactive participatory workshops, interactive webinars, as this very one, summer schools, train the trainer sessions, and the open collaborative online course that it is now online and available, and it will be online and available for the next three weeks, and you may join. Uh, all our programs, all our training offer is offered for free, thanks to the funding from the European Union. We are a consortium of partners uh, all over Europe. We are 12 different organizations with uh, a great experience in developing training methods and materials and in executing trainings. And uh, I will close this very short introduction of the project by letting you know that we have a YouTube channel which is called Gender Equality Academy EU, where you may find all our webinar series, the ones that you may have lost, and this very one will be uploaded in the uh, YouTube channel. Please subscribe so you receive a notification every time we upload a new video. And as I said earlier, there are three weeks left to join the online course Gender Equality in Research and Innovation. This is a self-paced course, so you can do it at, at your own uh, time, at your own free time in the realms of the, the three weeks that uh, have been left. And uh, I would like to thank you very much for the attention and to let you know that we are live tweeting and you may join us with your impressions of this webinar. And without any further delay, I grant the floor to my colleague, Natasa Sega. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Vasia, for this introduction about the project. Um, my name is Natasha Sega, and today with my colleague Maria San Giuliano, we are the Smart Venice team in charge of moderating this webinar. I will just introduce you briefly about the G Academy webinar, webinar series, but first I want to welcome all our participants coming from 30 different countries around the globe. You are all very welcome and I hope you will find your participation useful and you will enjoy this webinar. The G Academy webinar series has the goal of making knowledge and good practice example available to a wider audience in a compact but still interactive format. What we are doing and what we are going to, to do in the following uh, month of this year and the next year is to develop uh, in total 12 webinars on several issues on gender equality in research and innovation that are linked with the in-person training and workshop on similar issues that we hope we are going to start again soon. I would like just to introduce a bit the platform we are now using. 
uh, and the way we are going to use it. So during this webinar, we will have two question and answer session, and we will collect your question also during, that you can pose also during the speaker's presentation through the question and answer button that you can find at the black bar at the bottom of your screen. Um, to communicate uh, between your, each others and also to report technical issues, you can use the chat box that you can also find at the bottom of the screen. And please be sure to select the right addresses when you're typing your question. So uh, to exchange with each other, you should select attendees and panelists together, while for technical issue, we ask you to select all panelists only. I will leave now the floor to my colleague Maria San Giuliano for introduce you with the today's webinar. Good afternoon, everybody, also from my side, uh, and welcome. Um, you have joined us uh, today uh, for this webinar. Um, you already uh, know uh, we will uh, deal with uh, intersectionality um, from an applied research perspective. We will try to understand uh, how the concept uh, of intersectionality can be applied uh, in research and innovation uh, processes. Another important learning objective uh, that we have today is to raise the awareness, sensitize about the importance of designing um, research and innovation uh, with an intersectional pers perspective, but also from the opposite side, um, we would like to show you which are the pitfalls uh, of ignoring such a perspective. We also, um, aim at inspiring you, providing with practical examples, uh, potentially useful for your uh, own um, uh, research. Uh, we will um, have two uh, keynote speakers and therefore two main presentations, one from Tiffany Lam uh, from the New Economics Foundation uh, in the UK, and the other one uh, from the US and uh, Sarah Myers West uh, from the Artificial Intelligence Now Institute in New York. So we will have two quite different, um, let's say, uh, disciplines and angles to deal with um, in applying intersectionality in, in scientific research. This is our agenda, it's quite uh, compact. Um, we are now going to uh, give the floor to uh, Tiffany Lam, and, um, and then we will have two separate uh, question and answer uh, sessions, one um, after each presentation. Um, the wrap up will be taken care of by, by our uh, partner colleague Marina Kakace from KI. Uh, who was actually uh, the one who uh, designed the uh, contents of this uh, webinar. Uh, so, um, having said this, um, I would also just uh, stress uh, and well that, that this webinar is part of the um, live, let's say, experience of the uh, Gender Equality Academy uh, online course, our doc, uh, and it's part of uh, the module six and inter on intersectional approaches. Uh, so I would just introduce you briefly to Tiffany Lam, our first presenter. Um, Tiffany, as I said already, is a consultant at the New Economics Foundation in London. She's an urbanist with an expertise um, in gender and sustainable mobility. Um, she, she focuses on uh, different research projects on inclusive cycling, uh, climate emergency responses, health inequality, but also local uh, economic development. And uh, her background um, is in city desi design and social science, as she has uh, a master uh, from the London School of Economics. Welcome, uh, Tiffany. Thank you, and the floor is yours. Uh, your microphone, Tiffany. Yes, you muted. Sorry about that. 
Um, so I'll be speaking about cycling and intersectionality and why an intersectional perspective is useful in promoting inclusive cycling. So I'll go over intersectionality, power and privilege, and then the gender gap in cycling. And then I'll bring up some issues around infrastructure, safety and representation and conclude with a couple of recommendations. So just to clarify um, by intersectional perspective, I mean an understanding that there are multiple aspects of identity, such as gender, sexual orientation, race, religion, age, um, physical ability or disability, etc., that interact in complex ways to shape how people experience the world. And an intersectional perspective also acknowledges that there are multiple kinds of discrimination and inequalities that are interconnected and therefore cannot be analyzed separately. And as it relates to urban mobility, as we pass through public spaces like streets, we experience multiple kinds of security and in insecurity due to social attitudes towards race, gender, class, age, ability, and modes of transportation. And this is why an intersectional perspective is relevant. So power is the ability to direct laws, policies, and investments that shape people's lives. And privilege is the accumulation of benefits of special rights, or when you think that something isn't a problem because it's not a problem to you personally. Both power and privilege have been extracted and hoarded, consciously or not, by certain groups at the expense of others, based on social categories such as race, class, gender, religion, and so on. And urban mobility is all about power and privilege because who gets to move where, when, and how are questions of power and privilege. So the gender gap in cycling is quite a global phenomenon despite the increased investments in cycling infrastructure in cities across the world over the past few years. In London, 73% of cyclists are men. And this is fairly consistent across English speaking low cycling contexts for every female cyclist there are three to four male cyclists. And this is just in terms of the daily commute, not necessarily um, athletic cycling or competitive cycling. And the same gender gap is increasingly emerging in some Latin American and Western European cities as well. And 85% of cyclists in London are white. So there are um, racial inequalities that compound these gender inequalities in cycling. So infrastructure uh, is one of the key issues and areas of investment around cycling, but we have to ask for whom and for what. So I'll start with the technocratic framing of cycling infrastructure and projects. So technocratic framing is a viewpoint that heavily favors quantitative data and emphasizes science, technology, engineering, and economics. Prioritizing technical considerations leaves little room for considerations of gender and social inclusion. And a technocratic framing is very present in cycling infrastructure planning and projects because material infrastructure and engineering, economic, or technology-oriented approaches are privileged at the expense of um, considerations of gender, diversity, and inclusion. And so when we look at London's cycling infrastructure plan, the mayor's vision for cycling in London came out in 2012. And that was the first policy document um, outlining what was going to happen in terms of cycling in London. And in the mayor's vision for cycling, in London, there are two main, or first of all, material infrastructure foregrounds that policy document. And there are two main types of material infrastructure that are described, the superhighways and the quietways. And you'll see that both superhighways and quietways enable journeys from the outskirts of London, the suburbs, into the city centre. So superhighways were 
built on direct uh, main roads, providing direct routes, sometimes with lanes with um, separation from car traffic. They were designed for able-bodied, confident cyclists who weren't as deterred by traffic. Um, and the name superhighways connotes speed, athleticism, aggression, and riskiness. And all of these characteristics are implicitly coded as male. So the superhighways are implicitly trying to target men and get more men cycling. The superhighways are also governed by a singular body, Transport for London, which means that there's more consistency in terms of surface material, uh, width, uh, signage, and street lighting. Meanwhile, the quietways are routes that go along back streets and quiet residential roads, and they were designed for novice or less confident cyclists. And again, the connotation of quietway suggest leisurely cycling, slowness, and they've been marketed to women, people with disabilities, children, and the elderly. The quiet ways were also last to be built and um, Transport for London still haven't completed all of the quiet ways yet. And unlike the super highways, which are governed by a singular body, the quiet ways are governed by Transport for London each individual London borough and an organization, uh, Sustrans, that delivers cycling infrastructure. So this piecemeal form of governance creates more confusion when you're actually traveling along a quiet way route compared to a superhighway, which is just more straightforward. And this reflects an implicit male bias because if we're building superhighways for men, and making it clearer um, to travel on and just easier, whereas quiet ways are being designed and marketed mainly for women, but they're not being prioritized in terms of the actual construction and the governance, then that represents a clear investment primarily directed at men at the expense of women. So, as I mentioned before, both the superhighways and quietways facilitate radio journeys from the outskirts of London into the city centre. And radio planning is the norm in transport planning, so we see it reproduced in cycling infrastructure projects. And it reflects an implicit male bias because it's based on the antiquated notion of the male breadwinner who travels from the suburban home <clears throat> into the city centre. Um, men also tend to make more work trips during peak hours, while women tend to make more frequent short distance journeys throughout the day. And because of the gender division of care responsibilities and household labor, women's journeys tend to be more encumbered because they're carrying things or people. Women also do more trip training. They combine journeys because they have, they have to make more stops during the day, like um, home to school to drop kids off, to work, to the supermarket, then back home. And they're not making that one journey from the house, uh, wherever it is, uh, presumably in the suburbs, way into the city center for work and back home at the end of the day. When we look at the employment status of Londoners, we see that despite being half of London's population, Women only represent 61% of the economically active population. And of that 61% of women who are economically active, only 65% are in full-time employment. So women are less likely to, or the gender pay gap and other forms of discrimination in the labor market make it so that women have fewer accesses to resources like money and time, which will impact how they travel in, their, in the city and what types of journeys they're able to make, how, uh, where, when, and why. So just looking at the employment stats, this really begs the question, why is radio planning still the norm? Um, we know that this isn't really how people with the diversity of the city population travels and radio planning disproportionately benefits men or caters to men's journeys. The changing nature of the labor market also calls into question uh, radio planning. What is this workplace that is being imagined and planned for? The delivery cyclists also um, 
are not accounted for in radio planning and um, transport for London data shows that more cycling journeys, most cycling journeys in London are not work related. We know that under lockdown, there have been significant reductions in work commutes. And if working from home becomes more normalized, then is radio planning really the most adequate and appropriate way to plan our transport systems? There's also an uneven distribution of cycling infrastructure investments, which disproportionately benefit wider, wealthier, and more educated people. Cycling investments, um, like all a lot of new cycling lanes in different cities across the world, have been proven to be geared towards those for whom cycling is a lifestyle choice, rather than those for whom cycling is a necessity due to spatial isolation because they can't access public transport where they live, or socioeconomic deprivation because they can't afford to buy a car and sometimes even can't afford to take public transport. And there's an argument that cities have been increasingly using cycling infrastructure as a quote unquote creative class carrot to attract wider, more affluent demographics while pushing out less desirable communities, often lower income minority communities. So moving on from infrastructure to safety, safety is gendered and racialized and also impacted by class, but these considerations of safety don't often enter into transport planning decisions. So compared to male cyclists, we know that female cyclists are four times more likely to be closely passed by drivers and twice as likely to be abused and harassed by drivers. Women are also likelier to hug the pavement or just cycle closer to the curb uh, compared to men when they're cycling. Street harassment is also a problem for women while cycling. The Streets Blog New York did um, an informal survey of female cyclists last summer and found that sexual harassment and physical and verbal assault were daily experiences for a lot of women cycling in New York. And here in the UK, 66% of girls have experienced sexual harassment in public space, and 66% of women in London have experienced sexual harassment on public transport or in public space. So again, safety from harassment isn't really factored into transport planning decisions and investments, but that is a really significant factor that limits women's mobility. Road safety is also racialized. We know that the top three barriers to cycling in Black and Hispanic communities in the U.S. are fear of traffic collision, fear of robbery or assault, and fear of racial profiling by the police. And this fear of racial profiling isn't unfounded, as 20% of Black and Hispanic men report having been unfairly stopped by the police. And during lockdown, we've seen that Black communities have been disproportionately targeted by police enforcing lockdown rules, both in the US and the UK and in other parts of Western Europe. We know that there are racial disparities in stop and search, which has increased by 32% in England and Wales, and ethnic minorities are over four times likelier to be stopped and searched than white people and specifically Black or Black British people are about 10 times likelier to be stopped and searched than white people. So again, um, there's a much broader conversation about policing and defunding police um, at the moment, uh, but we know that there are clear racial disparities in how police enforce certain rules and laws, and this again is something that impacts how communities of color move around the city but doesn't enter into transport planning decisions and investments. So the main point is that identity influences vulnerability and safety is more than protection from cars. So it's important to keep in mind that when people live at the intersection of multiple vectors of oppression, like racism, sexism, classism, uh, homophobia, things like that, Unfettered access to mobility and public space are not guaranteed. So 
my last point will be on representation and who is the cyclist for whom is cycling infrastructure built. So two common and facetious stereotypes of cyclists are the mammals, the middle-aged men in Lycra, and the hipsters who ride fixed, ears, uh, fixed gear bikes and have lots of tattoos. And while these stereotypes are um, funny, they are both implicitly coding cyclists as white, able-bodied, male, and middle class. And oftentimes these stereotypes appear and reappear in policy documents. So they're mentioned in the mayor's vision for cycling in London multiple times and even commended for their quote unquote bravery um, or willingness to just cycle on the roads. So it's problematic when these really limiting and narrow stereotypes are reproduced and reinforced in official policy documents. And it's especially problematic if these are who um, engineers who build cycling infrastructure are designing for. They imagine the cyclist only as a mammal or a hipster, basically a middle-class white man. And 49% of Londoners say that cycling isn't for quote-unquote people like me. So it's really important that there's more diversity and inclusion in the way we talk about cycling and cyclists and the language and images used to represent cycling. And this isn't just a London problem. Research from San Francisco shows, again, that the idea that people like me don't ride a bicycle is a big barrier to cycling among women and especially women of color. And um, I did a Mind the Cycling Gender Gap zine in which I interviewed several women um, about cycling, gender, race, and the city, and one of my contributors said, cycling still seems to be an elitist pastime, not the domain of women or people of color. It's also hard to access the culture that comes along with it, like joining a cycle group and having the correct gear. Cycling has to become a common or normal site for women. I seek out and stay in touch with role models, other women who love cycling and do it daily. This idea of social infrastructure to support um, underrepresented communities in cycling and to help diversify cycling is really important. So that brings me to my recommendations. One, increase diversity and gender expertise. So it's not just enough to add women or people of color and stir and think that things will inherently be better or more diverse and inclusive. It can't happen without more diversity, but it also needs to have gender expertise or at least a, an understanding of intersectionality, what it means, why it's important and how to apply it. And another high level recommendation is change the narrative from cycling and why people should cycle more to um, help with climate change or to promote health or reduce health inequalities, the narrative should fundamentally be about the right to the city because the right to freely move around the city on two wheels or one foot um, without fear of harassment should be a right that we are all entitled to, but unfortunately it isn't the reality. And reframing cycling debates around the right to the city would be less polarizing than just arguing about where to build more cycle infrastructure or things like that. And the right to the city is defined as far more than the individual liberty to access urban resources. The right to the city is a right to change ourselves by changing the city. It's about democratic control over the city with the right to access, occupy, and use urban space. This previously um, was really only featured in academic concept, uh, contexts, but the right to the city has increasingly made its way into global urban policy debates. Um, so it features in the UN New Urban Agenda, which came out in 2016, and the right to the city here is defined as the right of all inhabitants present to occupy, use, and produce just, inclusive, and sustainable cities defined as common good essential to the quality of life. And in addition to those high level recommendations, some more concrete recommendations are 
one, collect gender disaggregated data because transport data and especially cycling data often isn't disaggregated, which makes it difficult to provide for people with greater needs. Two, conduct gender safety audits because perceptions of safety are gendered and they're not captured in typical engineering approaches to building cycling infrastructure and perceptions of safety can sometimes be more important than actual safety because it can really impact whether you even want to go out or cycle. Um, three, invest in high quality orbital and radio cycling routes that function as a joined up network. So it's really not enough to just continue with this radio planning norm in the way we build transport and cycling infrastructure because that isn't reflective of most people's journeys. Four, strengthen and support social infrastructure because material infrastructure is important. Um, it's necessary, but it's not sufficient to get more diverse kinds of people cycling. And finally, diversify imagery and representation of cyclists. That is all for now. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Tiffany, for a very interesting and really informative uh, presentation. Um, I would just like to invite uh, everybody to um, uh, feel free and uh, post questions in the questions and answer um, box that we have. Uh, so far, nobody uh, did, did it, but uh, please, um, we would re really like to have um, uh, this um, opportunity for uh, interaction um, and Tiffany would be happy to uh, answer your questions. I, I could um, break the ice, so to speak, uh, and ask you, uh, Tiffany, about um, uh, you referred to um, a technocratic approach to um, urban cycling and in general probably uh, urban planning. Uh, and uh, and also you describe this te technocratic approach as um, a predominance of um, quantitative uh, methodologies. Uh, did you do you feel do you think that um, this is also including um, uh, let's say um, a difficulty in um, adopting uh, an intersectional perspective and what other, um, I mean, how do you complement uh, then this with qualitative uh, methods? Yeah, so I definitely think that um, the technocratic framing has a lot to do with the uh, lack of knowledge about intersectionality, its relevance and its applications. The technocratic framing is also very closely associated with the gender binary because a technocratic approach inherently creates this false dichotomy between hard, objective, technical knowledge, um, which is quantifiable, versus soft, um, social, and qualitative data that isn't readily quantifiable. And it's really it, it's one of many uh, false binaries in urban and transport planning. And I think there really has to be a paradigm shift to move away from this technocratic framing and this idea that transport is about moving as many people as quickly as with this efficiency model and into a a model that centers lived experiences and the diversity of people's needs to be mobile or immobile. And I think during um, this time, during the pandemic, there have been a lot of interesting questions raised around whose mobility we are facilitating and why, and whether um, certain moods or certain types of journeys should be more privileged than the system currently allows. Right, thank you very much, uh, Tiffany. Uh, 
we, we have, have yeah. yeah yeah we we had we received some questions from our audience uh we'll try to to collect some of them um so angela is uh, first of all thank you thank you thanking you for your presentation very interesting and she asking how do you think that people in transportation can be motivated to learn more about diversity and gender and i'm adding to this the one of ines which is asking which kind uh, of social infrastructure then will be more useful to promote female cycling mm -hmm. So to address Angela's question, I think, um, interestingly, a lot of cities have been putting really ambitious targets to get X percent of people cycling by 2025 or 2030. And this has been the case um, since, the pan since before the pandemic, just to address the climate emergency um, and to decarbonize transport. And what a lot of cities are finding is that without addressing the lack of diversity in cycling, those targets just aren't going to be feasible. So it's ironic that setting targets was a way to kind of not address intersectionality or social inclusion and just continue along this very technocratic um, target driven system. But it's forcing a conversation about diversity, inclusion, and intersectionality just because you need to address that to get more people cycling to meet those targets. And in terms of social infrastructure, that could be useful to get more women and diverse populations cycling. Some examples are um, peer support networks. Uh, so previously I lived in Washington DC and I was involved in the Women and Bicycles group and the way it worked was um, there were several women who would volunteer um, and recruit like four to six women in their lives who didn't really ride a bicycle but were interested in doing it and just create a peer support group that could really um, involve whatever you wanted it to. So for me, we did group rides on the weekends, like it would just be, hey, let's um, bike to this new cafe for brunch together, or let's just bike to this bar after work um, and grab a drink together. And it was just a relaxed environment that um, made cycling a social activity and thing fun and not intimidating because you had friends there with you to support you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for, for answering. Uh, I think this touch also the, yeah, the, the question of from Katerina that is asking, um, we, uh, if you can also provide a fairy and more inclusive cycling infrastructure that are already implemented, that could inspire other cities. And yeah, and also Jana is uh, saying that maybe the situation in cycling, uh, in urban cycling can also depending on the population size, which uh, I believe so. And, and beside this, we have uh, a different uh, kind of question from Natalie is that is asking uh, if this allocation of resources to cycling in London mean that less support than are given to public transportation and in, if it's the case uh, is gender budgeting a way to make it visible? I'll start with the gender budgeting since that definitely is a good recommendation. It's good practice but often not practiced. Um, I don't know that public transport and cycling investments are kind of this zero-sum game where investment in one decreases investment in other. The current situation is that transport for London are in very bad financial shape um, and that's making it really difficult for them to make any investments in public transport and walking and cycling infrastructure at the moment, even though there are concerted efforts or a lot of um, PR efforts to communicate that these are still important. Uh, but I think that 
collecting gender disaggregated data and not necessarily stopping at gender, but also looking at race um, would be helpful in just showing who uses what modes of transport when and to get to where in order to get a more holistic picture of where there might be more need and where investments should be directed to. Um, I can't see the other questions on the side at the moment. There are two uh, interesting and connected questions. Um, one from uh, Jana asking if uh, you think that uh, the situation might be different when uh, in cities with female uh, mayor and another one actually came into the chat from Sile uh, and she's asking that, I mean, it's a similar one. Do you think not only ensuring that there are more genders at the decision making level uh, in design and planning levels, but also uh, more uh, diverse community engagement could help with this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so part of reframing transport from a very technocratic exercise and sector would necessarily involve more community engagement and centering diverse people's lived experiences at the heart of it rather than as an afterthought or just a consultation thing so you can tick the box and say you've done it. Um, and I think we really just need a fundamental overhaul in the way we think about transport. It's not about like large scale movement of goods. It's about how people move on a day to day basis. And that human mobility element is often missing. Um, and I think that we have seen some quite positive improvements for cycling infrastructure and inclusive cycling in cities where there are um, female mayors like in Paris with Mayor Hidalgo. Um, however, it's not just about adding more women or getting more women into leadership. That's definitely a, an important step, but we know that women can internalize sexist and misogynist beliefs and reproduce them. And this is why you need an intersectional perspective and or gender expertise at the same time, because it's not just about a different type of body or face in the room. It's about more diversity and the added knowledge of intersectionality and how to apply it and why it's important. Yes, I think we could uh, close with a very with a, with a, the very last two questions. Um, one from um, uh, Luciano um, asking, um, where is it only a problem of policy making, or uh, it regards scientific practices and too narrow disciplinary approaches uh, when it comes to the lack of an intersectional uh, analysis? Um, and then we also add um, um, uh, another participant, Suzanne, uh, who was, no, I, uh, well, I missed her name here, but there was a request for some uh, good practices. Mm -hmm. So um, for the first question about whether it's only a problem with policymakers um, or also scientific practices and two narrow disciplinary approaches. Um, yeah, engineering definitely is a large part of the problem. Um, and the whole built environment sector, they're all framed in a very technocratic way that makes it seem like the creation of our cities, our public spaces, and our transport systems are um, just technocratic exercises, like an objective hard science, when really it's about how people experience the spaces they live and move in. And that's often missing from the picture. And part of the reason, or I guess another aspect of the technocratic framing of engineering, urban planning, and those sectors um, is that it creates a very masculinist culture because from a young age, girls are socialized to avoid hard sciences um, or taught that math really isn't for them. Whereas boys are encouraged to problem solve, to pursue hard sciences and maths and go into those fields. And that is a problem when you have a room full 
of people who are designing infrastructure that's meant to fulfill social needs, but have never really had to consider who they're designing for and what their needs might even be. And to address the second question about um, good practice examples, um, so there are different elements of good practice kind of scattered all over. So for example, uh, last year, or maybe two years ago, the city of San Francisco collected gender, race, and class disaggregated data on usage of a new cycling, uh, new cycling infrastructure. So they could get a sense of who was using the new cycling infrastructure that was built and whether the benefits had been distributed evenly. Uh, the city of Barcelona has integrated gender disaggregated data and gender budgeting in their mobility planning. Um, and here in London, there has been a growing campaign to diversify the imagery and representation of cyclists to get more women cycling. And in Bogota, there was the first um, more Women on Bicycles International Congress last year in September to promote the range of cycling feminist activist groups and to try and encourage more women to ride bicycles um, and including it as a public policy goal, forcing the gender secretary and the mobility secretary to collaborate. So it's bringing mainly engineers together with um, the gender secretary who did have people who knew about intersectionality, how to apply it, um, and that convergence is still ongoing. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot, uh, Tiffany. So it looks really that there are some signs, uh, things are changing and, and awareness is incre slowly increasing. Um, there are, the chat is really full of uh, congratulations and many thanks for an insightful and inspiring presentation. So thanks again. It's uh, time to um, really move to our next speaker, therefore uh, a different um, disciplinary field, but still uh, we, we still refer to uh, intersectionality approaches. Uh, so um, let me just briefly introduce you to Sarah Myers-West, um, a postdoctoral -doc researcher at the AI Now Institute from New York University. Uh, Sarah, um, as research uh, is focused on a critical study of technology and culture, emphasizing historical and ethnographic methods. And she uh, currently works on a project uh, on uh, diversity and inclusion in technological communities, exploring a nexus of artificial intelligence, gender and intersectionality. The floor is yours, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let me just share my slides. Go to present. There we go. Um, well, thank you all very much. I that was a fascinating presentation, um, Tiffany and. Uh, a tough one to follow up on, but um, I'm going to be talking through a study um, that we published um, that's sort of the start of an ongoing project looking at the dynamics of gender, race, and power in artificial intelligence. Um, just as background, um, the AI Now Institute is a research institute that's devoted to studying the social implications of artificial intelligence. Um, we're an interdisciplinary research center that's housed at NYU. Um, and what that means um, is that we um, have researchers with backgrounds in engineering, in data science and healthcare. Um, we have partnerships across um, multiple programs in engineering, law, education, data science, business, and math. Um, we, we take the, um, the project of interdisciplinarity pretty seriously um, in order to offer a different lens on um, studying the impact of AI. 
Um, and so this pilot study, um, I conducted at the start of my postdoc, um, and it forms the background of a much larger research program um, examining the dynamics of gender, race, and power in AI. Um, and we wanted to really get a sense of the current and historical landscape of diversity in the field. Um, so we started with a cross-disciplinary survey of peer-reviewed studies, but what we found early on was that um, these were limiting um, in many ways because um, the peer-reviewed process reflects barriers to inclusion that would inhibit the kind of intersectional lens that we wanted to take. So we also began including informal sources, blog posts or medium posts by folks working within um, AI firms. Um, tweets and other kinds of articles. Um, and what we found was that there's ample evidence that the field of AI is in the midst of a diversity crisis. Um, so a few indicative statistics, 18% of authors at the leading AI conferences are women. 80% um, of AI professors are men. Women comprise only 15% of AI research staff at Facebook, 10% at Google. Um, we don't have very much public data at all on trans or non-binary non workers. Um, and for reasons that I can discuss um, in more detail during the Q&A, we know a lot less about the state of racial diversity across the field, but the indicators are that it's much worse. Um, and these are how the companies themselves represent um, their uh, racial diversity. Um, what this shows is that the number of women and people of color um, working in AI decreased at the same time that the tech industry was establishing itself as a nexus of wealth and power. And it's even more significant when we recognize that these diversity figures are actually not reflective of trends in STEM fields as a whole. So in fields outside of computer science and AI, um, racial and gender diversity has shown a marked improvement. But as I discovered, we really need to look beyond what statistics alone can illustrate um, to see a fuller picture. Um, so we see this uh, crisis unfolding across all of the biggest players involved in the development of AI today. Um, so a few examples, there's a class action suit being led by Microsoft workers alleging a systematic failure to take allegations of harassment and discrimination seriously. Um, there's a federal investigation into gender discrimination at Uber. Apple dismissed concerns about uh, its lack of workplace diversity as a solvable issue, um, but then called proposals for uh, diverse hiring practices and specifically to tie this um, to, uh, to shareholder revenue uh, to be too burdensome. Um, an audit of Google's pay practices by the Department of Labor found six to seven standard deviations between pay for men and women in almost every job category. Um, black employees at Facebook recount being aggressively treated by campus security and dis dissuaded from taking part in black affinity group um, activities. Um, and a lawsuit filed against Tesla alleges gender discrimination, retaliation, and a hostile work environment. Um, one re worker recounted that there were more men named Matt in her group than women. So clearly we know that there's a problem. And what I found was that the, it's really not the evidence that's the issue here. Um, in fact, I, I found mountains of studies focusing just on the pipeline, which is a term that's used in the industry to refer to the absence of diverse candidates in the hiring pool. Um, this is often used to justify, by firms to justify why they can't achieve diversity, um, allegedly due to scarcity. Um, and as a sample, here are a few titles from these studies, things like why are there so few women computer scientists? Why are women leaving computing? Where have all the girls gone? Why do some gender gaps remain while others do not? And my personal favorite, will computer engineer Barbie impact young women's career choices? Um, relying primarily on survey-based research conducted in educational settings, pipeline studies seek to understand the factors that lead to gender-based discrimination in computer science more precisely by interrogating what drives women and people of color away from the field and implicitly what might make them stay. Um, 
one thing to note is that often studies of this space address gender as solely a binary phenomenon, um, so erasing the experiences of members of the trans community. Um, and they also largely fail to acknowledge the ways in which forms of oppression intersect, um, that people are, are impacted differently when you take into account differences in race, class, and ability, among other characteristics. What this means implicitly is that the sort of women in tech initiatives that we see coming out of pipeline work, um, they implicitly benefit white women um, over others. Um, they largely converge on the same findings, and these are probably familiar to um, many of you if you're, you're coming here already interested in intersectionality, um, that cultural dynamics play a, a crucial role, um, particularly uh, a student's uh, self-assessment of whether they're a good fit with um, tech is likely to influence whether or not they're going to stay or leave computing. Um, and they tend, women tend to persist in computer science when they reject and find alternatives to the dominant culture of the field. Um, they uh, look at stereotypes, particularly sort of geek culture. Um, other studies look um, at much deeper structural factors that influence um, specifically gender-based discrimination. Um, male students are much more likely to enter computer science programs with existing programming skills. Um, and it, this creates a sense among women computer stu science students that they're constantly behind. And this starts at a very early age. Um, girls have a much harder time gaining access to computers, uh, both at home and in school, um, than uh, boys do. So they're, they're at a disadvantage when trying to acquire these skills. Um, many uh, women students tend to underestimate their own capabilities and both male and female students tend to incorrectly believe that male computer science majors have higher GPAs when they in fact do not. Um, and then lastly, uh, overt hostility toward women and people of color is a, is a critical factor. Despite the contribution of these studies to a better understanding of the factors influencing uh, participation, um, they can have significant limitations that often are unacknowledged. Um, they often rely on samples of convenience. Um, for example, professors who are conducting surveys in classes that they teach. Um, they uh, often use self-reported data. Um, they're generally a, a small N size. Um, but most importantly, they place the onus to address the problem on those who are being discriminated against. Um, remember, it's why do women avoid computer science? Uh, what, uh, where have all the girls gone? Rather than what are the structural barriers that are inhibiting um, women, uh, women's success in the field? Um, so this is a pretty narrow frame through which to view potential barriers to inclusion. Um, and largely this means that the solutions are addressed toward edu educators and higher education institutions. While important, this is not an excuse not for, for companies not to address things like discrimination in how they recruit um, potential employees, um, actually existing racism, ableism, and misogyny um, in the workplace. Um, and what we've seen in practice is though we have, you know, very frequently documented cultures of exclusion in these companies, there's been no real change in diversity within, within them, despite the volume of studies um, and their relatively consistent findings. And in fact, we see similar trends bear out historically. Um, you may know that computer programming was uh, originally seen as women's work, um, and it was when programming began to be seen as a professionalized and expert domain that it was gendered ma uh, masculine. Um, as the historian Mar, Mar Hicks writes, throughout history, it has often not been the content of the work, but the identity of the worker performing it that determined its status. So let's take a step back for a moment. What I've just traced out is that discrimination in the field of AI is extensive, that there's ample evidence to support it, um, and that it has a very long history. 
Now I want to shift gears to talk about the consequences as we see them emerging in AI systems themselves. So a familiar example, um, you, you've probably encountered digital voice assistants like Siri and Alexa. Um, a recent UNESCO report found that um, these assistants are perpetuating gender biases because they tend to situate the women's voices um, in subservient roles. And if you look across the entire product category, nearly all such uh, products are gendered feminine. Um, and this is actually reflective of gender dynamics that have existed for a long time. If you were to look at the earliest tests of voice recognition systems, um, they literally couldn't hear women because they were developed and tested by mostly men engineers. Um, but I can give you some more examples. Um, there was a, a famous uh, report by ProPublica that looked at a computer program that was used in the US criminal justice system to try and predict the likelihood of recidivism, the likelihood that um, someone who had been incarcerated would be likely to recommit a crime. Um, and they found that this system was exhibiting systemic uh, racial biases um, while it was already being deployed by judges to determine the amount to set bail um, with very little to no um, means of, of external accountability. Um, these dynamics also have important implications for our safety on the roads. Um, so companies like Uber are testing out self-driving vehicles um, across several locations in the US. And in 2018, one of these cars hit and killed a pedestrian. Now, as you can see from this image, the pedestrian was wheeling a bicycle across the road. Um, Self-driving cars rely on computer vision software to look for things like lines on the road and street signs. And it just didn't know how to make sense of this particular image. The scholar Karen Nakamura has described how this is especially concerning for members of the disability community because this image looks you know, fairly similar to a person who is moving across the street in a wheelchair. Autonomous vehicles can thus present a real danger to the dis disabled community because they don't really know how to recognize bodies that move differently through the world. I'd like to explicitly call out work by the machine learning researchers Timnit Gebru, Joy Bulemwini, and Deb Raji um, because they did the work to uncover a systematic failure in widely used facial recognition systems to recognize the faces of darker skinned women. I can give you so many more examples of discriminating systems uh, from cancer screeners that have higher rates of failure in black patients because the training data uh, used to um, train them are, is predominantly white to soap dispensers that can't recognize um, darker uh, pigmented skin. I could go on and on. Um, discrimination and inequity in the field of AI thus has significant material consequences, particularly for underrepresented groups who are already excluded from resources and opportunities. So for this reason alone, the diversity crisis in the AI sector needs to be urgently addressed. But in the case of AI, the stakes are in fact even higher because these patterns of discrimination and exclusion reverberate well beyond the workplace into the wider world. And so I'd like to talk through one final example in a bit more detail. Um, it was revealed a couple of years ago that Amazon developed a hiring tool that would help it to rank and assign scores to resumes submitted for open positions. Um, the idea was that they would train the system to identify talented candidates who would be a good fit for Amazon based on data from the company's past hiring decisions, kind of similar to how Amazon makes recommendations for products you might want to buy based on your past purchases. The goal was to surface the best talent and to reduce the likelihood of bias. What they found in practice, though, was that this system learned to downgrade candidates who attended certain all-women's universities. Um, they downgraded others for even mentioning the word women in their resume. 
And while they tried to apply techniques to reduce the bias, um, they found that it was too deeply baked in. They just could not develop a system that would function without it discriminating. So ultimately they scrapped it entirely. What does this example teach us? Well, on the most simplistic level, it illustrates a principle that's uh, pretty familiar in data science, that the idea of garbage in, garbage out. Um, the trading data that Amazon used was based on its past hiring decisions. And as it happens, the company's engineering workforce is made up predominantly of men. This is why qualities associated women were systematically downranked in the system. But it also shows us how difficult it is to build a, an AI system that doesn't discriminate. Amazon employs some of the world's leading machine learning researchers. And after applying cutting edge techniques in data science, they couldn't produce a system that wouldn't discriminate. And what can the rest of us do? Often the remedies to discriminatory systems risk amplifying harmful practices instead of solving them. Um, so while a frequent solution proposed um, when we see biased AI is to try and diversify the data set, um, a similar dynamic to what we hear when you know, a, a field is not particularly diverse that we need to bring more bodies into the room. Um, but as uh, researchers like Drs. Gebru, Boldham, Winnie, and Deb Raji have pointed out, um, this has led to proposals that would actually end up leading uh, to increased surveillance of the very communities that are being harmed. So I think the core lesson here is not to, not to deploy you know, quick fixes to these problems, but for those of us who are interested in understanding intersectional perspectives, to look um, for deeper and more systemic questions in our research by examining the dynamics of power. As my colleague Meredith Whitaker put it, um, we need to be asking what assumptions about worth, ability, and potential do these systems reflect and reproduce? And who was at the table when these assumptions were encoded? In conclusion, I would be remiss if I did not foreground the work that has deeply shaped my own. So if you are looking to dive any deeper into these issues, these authors are a really fantastic place to start. Um, and with that, I will say thank you very much and look forward to chatting more. Thanks, Sarah. Um, it was really, really uh, yet another one, um, yet another uh, very, very uh, inspiring and insightful presentation. Um, while our um, uh, participants um, uh, start uh, typing their questions in the uh, Q&A uh, box, um, I would just comment and briefly ask you, I was really um, uh, in a way struck by your final uh, considerations uh, on the um, garbage in, garbage out uh, dynamic. Mm -hmm. um, because for a certain time when I was um, looking into this um, a, uh, a artificial intelligence bias uh, world, I was quite fascinated by the possibilities uh, for mitigating uh, bias and and those um, uh, algorithms which were then uh, worked out um, to uh, to to debias uh, artificial intelligence like uh, word, word embedding systems uh, which were um, capable of of um, reducing the bias or even the um, uh, fairness monitor from IBM um, mm -hmm. was deployed at a certain point uh, as an open open source uh, technology. But I understand from your presentation that you, um, in a way, you are um, skeptical precisely because of uh, the bias which is already there in the data sets, right? Could you, in, yeah. I, I think that's a great question. I think that that's part of the problem um, that we do need to look at at the training data, but I think that it's a 
um, only a small part of a much larger social issue. Um, so the, the data sets that are frequently used to train these systems, what they're really doing is reflecting larger patterns of social inequality. Um, and so we need to expand the frame to consider those, those larger dynamics of inequality and how AI specifically uh, fits into them. Um, there are things that we're just not going to be able to fix through technology. It's, it's actually addressing the, the larger social harm. Um, but it is worth considering the role that AI specifically plays. Um, and what I would argue is that often what it does is reflect and amplify these existing patterns of inequality um, and often make it much harder to identify them. Um, it's hard to trace through you know, the specific cause of a discriminatory output um, from a machine learning system. So there's sort of an obfuscating role um, that AI can play. Um, and that's why I think it's really important to have, you know, um, greater diversity in disciplinary perspectives, but even more importantly, a, a truly intersectional approach that centers the communities that are most impacted by these systems. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Indeed, this is related also, your answer is actually related with one question that we had uh, from Fa Fabio that uh, say, says that what you said about technical remedies to algorithm bias being faulted is really interesting because solutions are generally sought in technical terms. He would like to know uh, some more about this and what an intended consequence they tend to have. And um, it's, yeah, um, sorry, yeah, about this, Mirella is also and, uh, adding that it sounds like a chicken or the egg problem. So would that artificial data sets help to break the pattern or, or not? I mean, I think we need to look beyond just the, the data set to look at other points along the sort of larger process of producing a system from um, what are the questions that it was designed to answer in the first place? Was the system designed for one reason and then repurposed for a completely different reason? Um, what happens when it's deployed? Um, for example, with the compass algorithm, um, you know, are judges just re relying purely on the output of the system or are they taking into account um, you know, other kinds of factors. There's a, there's a much sort of wider range of research that's needed um, that looks at the social, political, economic, and really the historical dynamics that are shaping the AI systems that are in use today. Great question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for, for your answer. And Jana also add that she thinks that the gender satisfaction of data is crucial, but mm. the unbiased interpretation is, of course, the paramount. And she's adding that um, there is still much conservatism when it comes to the methodology in science in general, so-called mm. the proof holders. And this is a huge obstacle when it comes to the unbiased research design indeed. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think that there's there still remains a lot of gatekeeping of what kind of research um, folks are able to do and how that research is valued. Um, and it's, it's really critical that we have spaces um, that encourage, um, encourage the, doing the work that really centers the, the communities that are most impacted. Yeah, indeed. Totally, I'm totally right. Yeah. Um, Julia is asking here through the chat, uh, she has one question related to the definition of artificial intelligence and mm. how it is defined in your work and how it is distinguished from machine learning. Oh, that's a great question. Um, because this term gets thrown around a lot. <laughs> um, so artificial intelligence, when we often 
use that term, the picture that comes into our heads is sort of like the sentient robots, the um, sort of like the Hollywood image of um, AI that, you know, replicates human intelligence. Um, I think in practice, um, artificial intelligence as it exists, um, you know, is most widely used in the world around us. The way that it works is essentially largely looking for patterns in giant sets of data um, and using that to predict trends in the future. Um, so when I'm talking about machine learning, I'm, I'm, that's sort of like a subset of that sort of pattern-based um, AI, which is what, what is mostly in use in the world around us. We don't really have the, the Hollywood version of AI currently. Yes, it was very clear. Thank you, Sarah. Um, we, I think we have still some minutes, so we can conclude again with the question from Luciano that sure. um, is asking, she, he's telling that uh, it was a great presentation and he has, um, if you have some more methodological tips to apply an intersectional perspective in this research and at which level for example, specific step to follow in the research process, research team composition, or the composition mm -hmm. of informants and interviews, topics of literature review, and etc. So it's more about the methodological tips, some methodological tips, yeah. Oh, that's a wonderful question. It's also a hard one to answer without the specifics of what kind of research you're conducting. Um, so, at a high level, um, a few things that I would attend to are um, how is power shaping the methods that you're using and the data that's, that you're producing? Um, and in your literature review, uh, looking at your citational practices, um, is it sort of reflecting a a lot of the canon of many of our disciplines um, tends to be largely produced by men, largely produced by white people, um, trying to like pay attention to who you're citing and what work is seen as valid and how gender, race, ability, sexuality can shape those dynamics of, of what work is valued. Um, I know certainly in the tech field, um, who is seen as sort of like technically competent has um, been defined explicitly um, in the past to the exclusion of, of women and gender minorities um, and to the exclusion of people of color to the extent that like engineering unions in the 19th century were making systems that women's bodies physically couldn't use in order to keep them out. Um, well, it's not always that explicit, but um, I think paying attention to um, the way that um, methods and disciplinary canons can ref reflect and uh, support, um, you know, systems of white supremacy, systems of patriarchy, um, systems of ableism, um, and so on, um, is, a, is a generally good practice. Thank you, Sarah. We have uh, very one minute left, so I will go with the very last question from Connor um, that is asking uh, if there is any way of measuring and certifying instances of artificial intelligence for intersectional awareness and maturity. Hmm. Um, so I, I, you can see in my presentation that I'm sort of skeptical of you know, sort of a notion that data are purely objective. I think that data are produced by humans and they reflect human patterns of behavior. I do think that it can be useful um, as a diagnostic tool though. Um, so for example, if you were working on building an artificial intelligence system and you found that there, the data um, is reflecting back to you biased results, that might be a place for investigation. Um, so I would, I would sort of flip it on its head and, and not say, you know, we treat the data as sort of the neutral objective products that we take for granted, but instead we use the 
data as a basis for further di further um, investigation. I hope that answers the question. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you for for all your good answer to, <laughs> to these not easy yes, questions. Uh, thanks for the good questions. Um, okay, you can move on uh, with the very final wrap up of this uh, webinar, very, very illuminating webinar. Uh, I would like to thank you again, both speaker and leave the floor to Marina Kakace for the final wrap up. Yes, thank you, Natasha, and thank you very much to our speakers. That was really so deeply interesting. And uh, also, I'm happy that for once, uh, it clearly emerged how intersectionality is not, as sometimes people think, uh, something very theoretical removed from reality. Actually, this is so socially relevant in these fields and many others. So that was, I think that was really something to, to stress and thank you for this. Uh, I would stress also the three levels that came out in today's discussion about the relevance of intersectional approaches. One is uh, the workforce diversity issue, which at the first sight might look some extrinsic factor, while I think it was clear from the presentation, particularly from Sarah, uh, how this really fits into then a system which, I mean, leaves no escape to technical uh, solutions. A second level is more about contents, contents and priorities. So contents and priorities which are connected to having a gendered on one hand and intersectional approach. So they go hand in hand, but also uh, the third level, the discrimination effects, which I mean derive from not taking into account these aspects. And uh, so some, we also had some recommendations and some indication for this. I was, as Maria, maybe was a, a bit, I mean, it hurt reading science into the technocratic frame, uh, blocking intersectional approaches and so intersectional justice from Tiffany. This was discussed already. I just wanted to, to raise it again. So I get the point, of course, in terms of quantitative approaches <laughs> and um, engineering culture. So I totally get this point and I really hope this, uh, the program of the GE Academy, the, this webinar, uh, really to make science more inclusion, more deeply interdisciplinary, intersectional, and uh, really able to, to be a factor of inclusion, not uh, of, uh, of exclusion. And uh, I really cannot refrain in terms of cycling from citing um, the seminal work of uh, the, one of the founders of the social construction of technology uh, school within the science and technology studies, Vibe Baker. Uh, he wrote a book about, of, which was titled something like of bicycle, bakelites and um, bulbs. Uh, I will provide reference uh, in the chat box. It's, um, it's a book where I, among other things, he talks how bicycles were built as a, initially very strongly in the 19th century, uh, male uh, framed artifact. And, uh, but indeed some women, some brave women did ride these high wheel bicycles, which were also very much insecure. And uh, what really made me laugh about this was that for instance, in the, in the United Kingdom at the time, on the paper, these women riding bicycles were called the, le, sorry for my French, le pet petroleurs, meaning women that uh, during the commune of Paris, so revolutionary women, that during the commune of Paris were said in rumors to have burnt down entire neighborhoods in Paris. And so it, it, it didn't sound strange to, to, I mean, to put together these two very different types of people just because women were riding bicycles. So this, this really makes me think, as, as Tiffany, what Tiffany was suggesting, how deeply embedded and how symbolically having women, having non-standard people moving freely around town uh, with a bicycle, for instance, was really some, is really something changing reality. So how this battle is, I mean, really deeply rooted into stereotypes, culture and society. 
but apart from, and, and then she highlighted infrastructure and we came to digital infrastructure with Sarah presentation. On the one hand, the workforce uh, point was, I mean, I mentioned that the other thing that was very much discussed and it's really important, is this about the technical or non-technical remedies which we may adopt in a sort of uh, what, she de what she described is a sort of Sisyphean task because uh, of course you can change the data sets but huge amounts, tons of new data information are every day produced, which reproduce bias and so really it's difficult to work only on that level. And this can be discouraging because we would need much more, I mean, multi-pronged strategies to, to address this. So um, awareness, culture, politics, and technical aspects as well, of course. And uh, it was nice, I mean, it was nice to learn in, in the preparation of this, this webinar, nice to learn that, I mean, there are movements, there are, I mean, studies, research, but also movements. Uh, Tiffany mentioned some today. About, about bicycles, but also about algorithm injustice. So there are also activi activist initiatives. And I think this is interesting and encouraging. In terms of research, the, uh, there was a question about methods. And indeed, uh, Sarah said, well, yes, we would need to know what discipline. And indeed, the methods, while it is clear what intersectionality is in terms of, I mean, theory, uh, epistemological assumptions when it comes to the practice of research what does that mean and from what I learned today uh, it is I mean depending on the discipline on the topic on the research questions of course and also it is very much an issue of self-reflection I mean of really questioning methods what you use usually and how do you apply methods and as Sarah was, was now answering to, to a question so how is power shaping the method that, that we ordinarily use so I think this is very enlightening. Last uh, I wanted just to yes to, to again thanks the speakers thanks all the people who mm, I mean supported the development of this webinar so Vasia and Vilabs, uh, of course, uh, Smart Venice for all the support throughout the, all the process. Also, I want to thank Agostina Lori from Yellow Window because she put in contact with one of our speakers and both speakers were so great today. So thank you also to Agostina. And uh, I need to remind you that um, when we disconnect, uh, a pop-up will open, hopefully, but in general it does. Uh, with a short exit question. We would really warmly uh, ask, ask you to fill it out because it's important. We have a lot of other initiatives going on, particularly after the summer break, and we would really like to, I mean, to improve. So please do, do share your uh, perspective on this webinar. Also remember the um, DOC, the Distributed Online Collaborative Course, is still online there is still i mean three weeks to go with animation and uh, and all the support from the smart venice team so that that'll be all for today again thank you for attending thanks to everybody that was really fun also and uh, have you all a nice evening thank you